great. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, happy Thrive Week. Really appreciate you guys logging in, especially on this beautiful day. Um, we are really lucky to be joined here by a Kellogg alum, um, Lawson Thalman, um, who's gonna spend the next hour with us teaching us about how to be a plant parent. Um, so quick bio, um, Lawson is um, a fourth generation family business owner of Chalet, um, which is a local uh, plant store up in the Wilmette area. Um, he helps keep the retail and landscape design business on the cutting edge through digital transformation, um, using his unique eye for technology and love for solving business problems. He helped launch Chalet's e-commerce business um, three years ago, which has been growing about 300% per year, um, and is passionate about using technology to help improve business and day-to-day -day life. Um, also seeks to balance this with a connection to nature and well-being um, with himself and others. Um, and he's experienced in meditation and lead sessions for customers and staff as part of Chalet's Learning Center offerings. Also did that at Kellogg when he was a student here. Um, and like I said, he earned his MBA from Kellogg um, last year in 2020. So with that, um, thank you so much for being here, Lawson. We're really excited. Um, I'll pass it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Kathleen. All right, so yeah, like Kathleen said, I actually graduated from Kellogg just uh, in this past winter quarter. Uh, I was in the part-time program and took me all of three and a half years. Uh, you know, during that time I was working for the family business, so I got to take classes as well, um, sort of helping out the family business. Uh, in particular, uh, I focused on the e-commerce business and other technology initiatives. Um, so Super glad to be able to connect back with you guys. Uh, fun fact for you, I actually was in uh, the wellness, class, wellness club, uh, not only in it, but I was on the executive board as well. So I was a uh, marketing director for a little while, while there. So those weekly newsletters that you see, um, those were sent by me just a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's cool to bring this all full circle. Um, <laughs> yeah, so we're, just as far as an administrative standpoint, we'll totally jump in with questions at any time. Um, we'll treat this just like a class uh, on Zoom for Kellogg. Um, you know, definitely mute yourself until you want to ask a question. You know, use the, the raise your hand function uh, on there just like you would in class or feel free to uh, start typing in the chat as well. Um, I'll lean on Kathleen to uh, help you know, let me know when there are, there are questions and feel free to uh, stop me at any point in time uh, throughout it so we can make it Nice and interactive. Um, so the topic is Plant Parenthood 101. And uh, it's funny because I mean, there's, there's just a lot of uh, different topics to dive into when it comes to plants. It's a very complex world. Nature is just a complex thing. And so when you say 101, you know, you try to you try to hit the basics. You know, what, what do you need to know in order to have some you know, general success with bringing plants into your home? Um, so I try my best to shrink it down to the things that I think are most important for you guys to, to know and walk away with here uh, in this hour format as well. Um, and I also tacked on to the end, of course, uh, um, true to uh, the Wellness Club theme, uh, focus on wellness a little bit and how plants can uh, improve uh, our lives from a, from a wellness standpoint, uh, as that's you know, something that's increasingly being studied. Uh, it's super interesting to me, and I imagine you guys are interested in learning about that as well. So with that, jump in. Uh, just a little bit of a background on Chalet. Kathleen did a great job uh, introducing us. Um, so you, you actually, you got the, uh, the free version. Uh, you, didn't, you guys didn't pay for, for premium, so you guys get some ads here in the front. I'm going to tell you all about my, my family business. <laughs> Uh, but basically, we're, uh, we have a garden center in Wilmette. Uh, if you're not you know, familiar with Chicagoland area, you grew up somewhere else, Wilmette's not too far from the Evanston campus, uh, about a 15-minute drive. And I actually grew up in a town called Glenview, kind of right next to there. Um, we actually started back in 1917 as a uh, landscape business. Um, and this shows you a nice picture. I think that was taken back in the 1920s. Uh, 1917 was when my great grandfather uh, just started you know, mowing his neighbor's lawn. And so it's kind of an unofficial start of the business, but 
I think I was taken in the 20s when I started to get up and running. Uh, and we've had farms throughout the, the history, but now we have a, a farm in Wisconsin where we do a lot of our growing uh, of our plants that we sell at the garden center or uh, through our landscape business. Uh, and here's our, our mission. Um, maybe relevant for you guys learning about missions and, and visions. And Hey Lawson, we can't see the slides. Can you share it? Oh, oh, I, I did present our mobile. I didn't share it. Good call. Good call. You're supposed to tell me that before. <laughs> All right. Do you have it now? Yep. Good. All right, sweet. All right. Look through a couple here. Uh, that's that picture I was referring to, uh, taken in the 20s. Um, and that's actually my dad on the right and myself on the left. So my dad is the president uh, today, represents the third generation. Uh, and Carly, whose voice I think you just heard, that's my sister. So it's very much a family business. And we're, we're proud of that. All right, so what we're gonna dive into today, today like I said, try to get you the basics, uh, just try to make sure you're gonna be successful walking away from here and uh, potentially bringing uh, your plants into your home. Um, here are kind of, here's an outline of the factors, I call them, that uh, are going to lead to your success or lack thereof. Um, and, you know, I'm calling the first three the basics because, you know, the last three are really kind of extra credit. If you get those first three down, light water and soil and nutrients, uh, you're going to be in pretty good shape. So I'll, I'll put some emphasis on that, but I'll, I'll touch on the last three uh, as well. And uh, the way I'm going to structure this is, uh, you know, I want you guys to understand how to pick the right plant for yourself. And so really take you through the, the buying process and the process of picking uh, the plant and the pot and all that good stuff with the understanding of how you want to care for it uh, and, you know, in the right setting to make sure you're setting yourself up for success. Um, and, you know, so photosynthesis, think about that when, when you talk about uh, the, uh, the things that are going to make a plant work for you. Uh, you know, dust off your, your, uh, your memory bank from uh, the grade school or whenever you took biology class. Um, that essentially you have, you know, several inputs uh, like carbon dioxide, light, etc. that's going to give you uh, hopefully the right outputs of leaf growth and, and other things as well as oxygen, which we'll talk about later. All right, choosing the right plant for your space. Uh, so you wanna consider your setting, you want to, uh, really the first step is just decide where you wanna put it. Um, you can go the other way, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest it, meaning picking out the plant and then figuring out where you wanna put it. You're gonna be most successful if you figure out the, the spot that you wanna put the plant and then find the right plant for that spot. Uh, so the number one thing to consider, I mean, this is a really basic consideration, but are you putting this on a tabletop or your floor? And that's, that's going to kind of drive what size you're going to get. Um, and, you know, so for example, I have my fiddle leaf fig here. That would look a little silly on a table. You're going to get some weird looks. You have that on your table when you have people over. Um, but, you know, so plants are measured by their diameter. Uh, you know, say eight, eight, eight inch across is really kind of the, the point where you can go either way, but Usually you're putting that on that and below, you're putting on a table, anything 10 inches and above, uh, you're, you're really gonna put um, on the floor. Uh, huge consideration, how much light does that spot get? Um, and we all have the benefit of spending a lot of time in the home nowadays. Um, and so you really get to observe, uh, you know, pick out that spot and observe how much sun is it getting. Uh, literally, you know, what, what times of day and how long does, is that sun streaming through the window? Um, and the number one consideration, when you, when you look at, you know, if you go on shallownursery.com and uh, you're, you're shopping through the different plants or if you're talking to a salesperson, uh, they're going to let you know this type of verbiage as far as what light preferences that these plants have. And the language that you'll hear a lot is direct versus indirect light. 
And so I want to demystify that a little bit because that's super important. Um, you know, you might have the question, what's direct versus indirect light? Well, literally, if you see uh, the sun rays coming through the window and directly touching uh, the plant, that is direct light. And, you know, you may, you may consider that good for all plants, but a lot of, some plants don't like that. Uh, some plants will actually, their, their leaves will get burned a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll kind of show you what that looks like. I put this uh, Drosena in the, uh, in the in direct sunlight and it didn't really like that. I want to make sure you're seeing that. You guys can see there's little uh, burn marks on there. And so you can see what can happen uh, when a plant that doesn't like direct light will get direct light. Uh, and same thing with uh, indirect light. Um, indirect light is, you know, what does that mean? Really when you have a plant that likes ind indirect light, uh, it's the sun is getting into that room, but it's just not directly touching uh, the plant's leaves. And it's, it's when, when a plant likes indirect light or even low light, um, it's really good at kind of pulling that uh, ambient light that uh, permeates around the room um, and instead of just actually taking the direct light. Um, and so low light is another consideration that you'll, you'll find um, in, in that same thing. It's, it's really uh, that the plant is better at finding that ambient light in the room. And it's interesting that the, the bands of light that, that plants like are something that really humans' eyes can't uh, tell. So you may think, oh, it's not getting uh, that direct light, but it's still finding the light and absorbing it to its, its leaves and kind of doing its thing from a uh, photosynthesis standpoint. Uh, and then the final question really is, how long do you want this plant to live? Now, that sounds like kind of a silly question, right? Lawson, and of course, I want my plant to live forever. Okay, great. But the reality is, you know, we're, especially in Chicago, don't have as much light as some of these natural environment, uh, these plants might be used to, say, Florida or even like Costa Rica or Indonesia uh, for some tropical plants. Uh, in Chicago, it's just not getting that much light. And so you do your best to keep it alive as long as you can. Um, but what happens is, here's a picture, here's a, a succulent that I have. And this is called getting leggy. And so succulents have a subjective lifespan. I mean, really about a year later, it'll start to look like this, where succulents are uh, used to being in the desert. If you just give them, you know, the typical Chicago light, even if it's direct light for several hours a day, it's, it's not gonna be super happy. The light's just not as strong here. And it starts to just reach out for the sun and it starts to, you know, the leaves are few and far between. It just starts to look a little weird. Um, and so you get to the point where this is probably on its, on its last legs. Uh, it'll live, but it doesn't look super great. So it's kind of up to you uh, as the subjective lifespan. And that, that was coined by a friend of mine, Daryl Chang, uh, houseplant journal on Instagram. He talks about that a lot. Um, so if you're someone that's going for houseplants from a static standpoint, you might, you know, only uh, like your succulents for, for a year. Um, if you want to, for example, put your plants in your bathroom that has no windows, um, I'm not gonna tell you you can't do that. I'm just gonna tell you that your plant's not gonna live very long. It's gonna enjoy the humidity, but it's not gonna enjoy not having any light. You know, again, like it might be low light, but it still wants uh, some light. Um, so if you want to every month buy a new plant, you know, come to chalet and, and uh, replace the plant in your bathroom, that's, that's good for me I and mean, that's good for business, right? So I'm not gonna argue, <laughs> not gonna argue with you there. All right, pots, watering, and drainage. These are things that are all kind of related and I kind of wanna walk through the process. So uh, it's really when, when you're shopping for plants and pots, uh, it's considering uh, what does the technique end up being for watering and it's kind of dependent on uh, what those choices are. Uh, so first of all, grower's pot, that's the black plastic pot. And there's my steak plant here. Show you an example of that. It's, you know, if you guys have bought plants before, you get this little black plastic. Sometimes it's green plastic. Uh, 
it's it's great you know from a plant standpoint it's it's the home it's been in and it's happy there um, but you might not like it from an aesthetic standpoint so say you want to pick a nice uh, designer pot you know your favorite color design what have you uh, at chalet we just have a crazy ridiculous amount of selection we actually just recently had uh, pots that were made that were the shape of a dinosaur so if that's your thing um, we, we got it for you um, so the first question to ask is, does the grower's pot fit inside? And so I'll give you an example here of this philodendron birkin. And say I, I, I picked out the plant right first, right? Um, now I'm gonna go throughout chalet and uh, find the right uh, plant for me. I like white, you know, nice clean look. And it's really this game going around and trying to match the uh, grower's pot with the designer pot. And so I'm gonna keep doing this until I find the right fit. And you know, sometimes the, the height isn't quite where it is, where you want it to be, and so it's popping out the top, and you don't really want that. You want it to sit and nestle nicely in there, just like that. Um, and so we call that dropping it in. That's, that's the easiest approach to go with. Um, even the verb plop has been thrown around. I don't know, that's a real word, but people, people say plop it in. Um, the other option is planting it in. So if you, are almost there, it doesn't quite fit in, um, but you really want that planter, that you really, you really want that pot, you can actually just take the uh, plant out of the grower's pot itself and then replant it into uh, the, the pot of your choice. Uh, and if you're at Chalet, we'll actually do that for you, um, but it's fairly uh, straightforward. It's, it's similar to the process of, of repotting, which we'll uh, talk about a little bit later. Uh, so drainage strategies, okay? So the next question we want to figure out is, you know, what, it's one of these three scenarios, really. Does the pot have a built-in saucer? And this is a innovative design in the world of pots that I love. I kind of look for these now. Uh, they have the saucer, what we'll call it, or the tray. Uh, it's kind of built in, it's, you know, it's attachable, but it's really part of the design of the, uh, with the planter and it's going to collect that water. And so you're good to go with this. I mean, you're, you're watering the plants and it's being collected in this, this tray and uh, you toss out any excess water and uh, you're good to go. It's, it's really the easiest approach to go for, so I advise it not to that. Um, the, other, the other one is, so the pot has a drainage hole. Um, and in that case, you need one of these plastic saucers and this is a little gross looking. And so that kind of uh, helps you decide which, which approach you want to take. Uh, so say I had this, this planter here. You could put it underneath and say there's a, a, a drainage hole in the bottom of this. Meaning if I water into the plant directly into here, the water will go out the bottom of this. And then you don't want it to go on your floor, of course. That's, that's kind of a, not a good idea. Um, so you're going to put this plastic saucer below your pot. It's not great from an aesthetic standpoint, but what you can do is uh, just to really do this for the, the time that you're watering the plant and then for several hours after, if not the whole day, uh, and then the water will collect into here and then you'll, you'll want to toss uh, the plants out. Uh, it's a little bit of a chore to do that, but uh, it is what it is. And if you look on the bottom, the bottom line, if you take nothing else away from the slide, kind of a technique for watering. Uh, water should come out of the bottom. And I'm actually gonna kind of do my best to demonstrate, but uh, imagine I'm planting or watering the plant here and a little bit comes out. And there, there's little ridges in this, uh, in this tray. And so it might, now you guys can't see that, can you? I'm trying to tip it without, spilling the water everywhere. <laughs> so there's little, there's little ridges in there. And it, if it, the water, enough water comes out where it's just kind of filling in those ridges and it's not really filling up uh, to the top of this tray, uh, you're okay. Cause that'll eventually evaporate. But if it does start to fill up uh, this tray, then you don't want the plant to be sitting in that water for longer than 30 minutes. So it's really uh, watering it and then monitoring it come back 30 minutes later, if there's too much water in there, uh, you're gonna wanna dump it out. Because what happens um, if you leave the plant uh, in that water, uh, what we call 
uh, having its feet wet, uh, it could lead to what's called root rot, which is kind of what it sounds like, uh, the roots are rotting, not, not a good situation. Um, no drainage hole, that's, that's kind of the third option here. Sink water, that's easy enough. I, I do that with a lot of my plants, uh, particularly this one. So no drainage hole on the bottom of this guy. And so I'll actually take this guy out and water him under the sink. And then you just kind of leave him in the sink for the next hour or two, let it drain all the water out uh, and then put it back in. That's, that's an approach that, that I like for a lot of my plants. Uh, direct watering in that monitor, uh, as we, we talked about. Um, create space for the drainage within the pot. It's kind of hard to demonstrate that, but what you can do is, uh, try my best to demonstrate it. And this is kind of a low budget way to do it, but there's actual products at Chalet for this. Uh, I put um, styrofoam on the bottom of this planter. I don't know if you can see it, but you can kind of see it on the bottom of this plant here. And that creates separation between the bottom of the grower's pot and the bottom of the designer pot. And what that does is just allow it to not be sitting in any of that water that it might, that might be collecting uh, at the bottom of, uh, of the pot. So you have a little bit more flexibility to you know, let that sit for a while. I eventually want to pour that water out, of course, but uh, don't have to worry about it you know, 30 minutes later. Is there any questions at this point? in the chat or anything, just moving on through. I got a quick one. Yeah. In that last example where like you're just lifting, uh, lifting the plant out of the pot a little with the styrofoam, I do that too. Is there a problem if like you see the plant's roots trying to grow out and then start, you know, dipping into where, where then the water would be sitting? I personally don't think that's a problem. That, and that, that happens to mine, I don't know if you, you saw yeah. that. Yeah, it starts to kind of grow through. That's just, that's kind of natural. Um, it's what the, the root growth is driven by where the water is. And so if it senses that there's water down there, it's gonna to try to go get it more or less. Uh, and that, you know, that's, not, that's not a problem in and of itself. You can, you can cut it as well, but uh, it, I haven't had a, a problem with that. Um, eventually, if there's a lot of roots just kind of falling up down there, uh, we'll talk about this later, but that's a sign that you might wanna repot it. Um, into a bigger pot, give it a little bit more space to kind of uh, maneuver around. Any other questions? Got one more from Anna Alicia. Hi there. Um, I had a question about the sink watering. Um, somebody gave me a plant and said that when they were taking care of it, they used to just like stick it in the sink and drown it almost with water and then let it drain, like giving it a plant bath. Is there too much water? Are, when you're doing sink watering, are you just pouring a regular amount in, or are you like drenching it and then letting it dry out? It depends on the plant, but I, I mean, I, some of them that are that, that can take it a little better. I just I just use the actual water faucet, but other times I'll use my uh, you know watering can like this. And you with, with the sink, you can't really go wrong as far as overwatering it, as long as you're just letting it sit there and drain out any of the excess water that it doesn't want more or less, it'll, it'll drain out. Uh, and I, I've actually heard it, someone at Chalet said the other day, you can water it really three times and, and soak it all the way through, watch the water go through the bottom, wait a little bit, soak it through again, soak it through a third time. Uh, and that, because really the goal is, is you want that entire, it's called the root ball, where the entire pot, circumference of the pot itself to be filled with water. And that gives it a nice even uh, approach where, um, the, the roots are gonna grow in a more uh, normal and even way on all sides and you know top and bottom of the plant. So you have a nice, even healthy root ball. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, whoever, whoever might've said that, that's probably what they were going for is making sure they're soaking the entire uh, root ball. Um, so yeah, yeah. The, the, only, the only implication around too much water in one given setting is uh, that it's gonna collect in this tray and it's gonna be sitting in there for 30 minutes. But if, if you let it, if you give it a place to, to go down the sink, then it's not a problem. And actually I have one more quick question. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, and maybe this is for after words, so you can table if, that, if that's necessary or if that makes sense, but um, any recommendations about like um, watering bulbs or self-watering pots? Um, what are thoughts on those? 
there might be a lot of conversation. I'm just thinking, particularly as a spring break is coming up and people are leaving potentially. Do you have a bulb in a uh, self watering pot? No, no, I have I have some watering bulbs, but I also have some self watering pots. Oh, okay, I got you. Yeah, I, I haven't experimented too uh, experimented too much with the uh, uh, self watering pots. Oh, I'm gonna, it's on my bucket list for sure. So, uh, you know, I can't answer specifically. I know, you know bulbs are are a completely different ballgame. Um, and I will admit that I don't have you know, a lot of knowledge there. Um, but I, I can follow up with you off- offline and maybe connect you with someone that is. Uh, more expert in that area. Is there one more? All right, so continuing on with the water theme, uh, we talked about kind of the techniques behind it. Um, Here, so this is the big question that you get is when to water, how often uh, do we water? And this is something we talk about at Chalet where it's simple to just say, oh, water once a week, or, you know, give a specific, uh, amount, you know, decrement of time uh, when to water it. But the reality is, is that's not going to lead to the most success because you got to understand that there's so many different factors that determine how much you should be watering. Uh, general rule of thumb, more light equals water more often. And I say water more often specifically instead of watering more because, uh, like I said, you know, you can continue to water it in one setting and you know, as long as the root ball is, is fully saturated, great. Uh, it's really about how often you water. And the more light you get, you know, it's, you go back to photosynthesis and you have inputs and then the output. You, you got really want to balance the light intake uh, from the plant and the water intake. So naturally in the winter, you're watering less often. Uh, and that's just something that, you know, you're going to foster your skills of observation uh, for the plant and talk about this in a second. Another uh, general rule of thumb is thinner leaves is water more often. So you think about the the extreme case in a succulent and the reason you can get away with uh, watering a succulent uh, less often is because the water is in the water is so thick and it's that particular category of plant where the, the leaves are so thick. Uh, and it actually is storing water in its leaves. And so it can get away with watering less, but thinner leaves uh, less so. Uh, my calathea is actually an example of thinner leaves. You can't really feel it, but if you kind of feel, this, this is paper, more or less. It feels like paper. So you're going to water that more often. And I find that if I don't water this guy two or three times a week, um, he, you know, he starts to get in trouble. And you can actually tell, uh, I'll talk about in a second, the implications around the, the actual soil itself, but you can tell here in this calathea, I actually just was out of town for about a week and this guy did not like that because I wasn't able to water him. Um, but if you can see that, you'll see some crispiness along the edge and you can even feel it to the touch, you know, describe that as crispy. It starts to disintegrate when I put my fingers on it. Uh, that, that indicates underwatering um, or, or a lack of moisture in general. And it could be because of humidity as well. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, a little later, but low humidity can do that as well. Um, so similar to the light uh, preferences, it's going to be described. Uh, you've gone chalet uh, on the actual product page itself. We're going to be talking to a salesperson uh, really anywhere. And this is kind of in the industry has, has come up with these two words and you'll see them phrased different ways. But you see the word moist or you see the word dry. That's kind of uh, indicates these two things. So with moist, that's gonna be like that calathea I showed. Uh, you're gonna to wanna to water that more often. And it's really a, looking at the surface or just kind of brushing your finger against the surface. If it feels dry, it's time to water it. Uh, you wanna make sure that it continually stays moist and continually has some water uh, to bring up into its leaf or into its roots. Uh, and you know, that could, again, we don't wanna give specifics about uh, how often to water, but typically multiple times per week. Um, Dry, and this is where you wanna actually stick your finger in to uh, the soil. And uh, if you don't feel any, if you feel a little bit of moisture, it's okay. You know, the wait and see approach is always good there. Uh, You you wanna err on the side of watering less with these guys. The 
the number one uh, reason that these guys die is overwatering, just watering too often. Uh, and so if you stick your finger in there and it's dry, uh, that's, that's the indication that we want to uh, water. And so after a few uh, you know, increments of practicing that, you'll kind of get to know how often you want to uh, water those guys and as it changes throughout the season as well. All right, this one's huge, and this is not usually covered in uh, Houseplants 101 type uh, publications, uh, but I really want to stress this here because I think it's a really uh, good concept to understand. And I'm stealing uh, a term from, uh, this, is, this is something that uh, Daryl Chang of Houseplants Journal, uh, both in his book, his blog, his Instagram, uh, is a big proponent of. And, you know, understanding that there's, there's an adjustment period, okay? So when you bring it home from the garden center, uh, it's going away from an environment that it just loved. There's just all kinds of humidity, light streaming through the greenhouse. It just loved it. So you bring it home and more times than not, it's gonna get less light uh, than it did uh, at Chalet or wherever you end up getting it. And so it's going to have an adjustment period where, hey, it's, I'm not getting enough of that input to be sustaining all of these leaves. So it starts to drop those leaves. And so you'll see the, the picture of this one. And I actually have an example of one, this philodendron birkin uh, that I brought home recently. And you'll see that, you know, this is a good angle here. Most of the plant is fine. I mean, these leaves are gorgeous. It's got a nice little white and green uh, pattern to it. But you have this one leaf here that is a little, little yellow and then we got a little brown tip so this you know we got i don't want to urge you to not overreact to this if it's just one leaf that's a natural part of the plant kind of balancing out in this new environment uh, and so you can just let nature take its course eventually it'll snip it off uh, and and you should be fine eventually it'll uh, kind of balance out Yeah, I keep, I keep stressing foster the skill of observation. You know, right from the beginning, uh, start to understand what different signs uh, uh, and colors you know, mean for, for the plants and what to do about it. And just, just don't overreact. overreact. Uh, the wait and see approach is always good. Feel free to uh, email into Chalet. I'll give you the contact info at the end. Um, but yeah, wait and see approach, no, don't overreact. Hey Lawson, we've got a question from Paul. Sure. Hey, how's it going? Um, so I was wondering, like, I have some of this, uh, like, drying up of the leaves. Can you just, like, take a look at this and tell me if it's, uh, yeah, like, an yeah, adjustment yeah. thing or, or what's going on here? I gotta, uh, let me see if I can flip the camera. Um, yeah, so, like, this guy, there, there are a couple of these, like, just dying leaves around here, like that one. Can you, can you see that? I'm pulling up my phone, I'm trying to... Get a better view here. All right, so what's the issue? So there are like a bunch of these like dying leaves kind of around the base. Is that something that I should be concerned about? <laughs> okay, so I mean, yeah, and this, this is a good example. This is what I see here is um, some of those leaves are, are dying, but that's, that's fine. So a lot of those leaves are, are healthy. I see a healthy plant there. And this is just a, this is an example of over the course of its life, it's, it's a natural uh, evolution where, you know, we, we lose hair all the time, right? Not, not a huge deal. So plants le lose leaves all the time. It's just, it's producing new leaves while uh, getting rid of old ones. And it's just kind of the natural cycle of things. So if I, and particularly those ones on the underside aren't getting as much light as some of the ones on the top. And so, I mean, what you want to do there is you got, yeah, you got a good looking plant. I mean, that's, that's a, that's a nice pothos there. Um, yeah, you. I love those ones that are kind of trailing and just keep going. And yeah, it's very artistic. Um, but yeah, you got a good plant there. Just take scissors or whatever you want to snip those out. And some of them are brittle enough to just kind of snap off of your hands. But yeah, you're, you're good to go. Sounds good. Thank you. Yep. All right, uh, fertilizer. 
Um, there's a lot of stuff you can nerd out about here, but the, the understanding is that um, this, is, this is what gives the plants nutrients, right? And the nutrients that it's most concerned with are nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. Uh, without nerdy, nerding out too much, you know, eat the different variations of those uh, will show up. And if you look at the uh, Dining Girl product here, this is actually what I use. Um, and I can kind of give you an example here. Uh, that 795 refers to the NPK ratio. Uh, and so, you know, e e each one of those has a different effect on, say, the foliage growth versus the, uh, if it's a flowering plant like an orchid, uh, it'll help the orchid bloom. And so this, this company will actually make products. So if you have an orchid, actually, there's one that has a picture of an orchid and obviously you know, that's the one you wanna get. Um, but this one is just a good general foliage growth uh, type uh, recipe, if you will. And the, I'm gonna give you a little minor uh, demo, if you will. Uh, this, so they say, they say put uh, one to three, you wanna read the instructions, but mix one to three fluid ounces per gallon. You know, so you wanna read the instructions when you uh, pour it into uh, your watering can. And maybe I can take a step back and just the understanding that how, how do you get fertilizer in there is it's, it's through the watering process. There's other ways to do it, but the most common way to do it is you're putting it into the water that you're going to put into the plant. And so uh, just like I, I cook with the recipes, I, I don't really listen to the actual uh, measurements. What I do is kind of understand, okay, it's gonna be a little bit of a, just the tip of the wrist into here. Quick one, maybe a second one. Um, and then you wanna dilute it and mix it up nice and good. So I'm shaking it here, just distributing it throughout there. Um, you know, it, again, it doesn't need to be perfect, but the understand, if you don't read the instructions, I mean, someone might go home and just actually pour this onto the plant. Don't do that. It's gonna actually burn the plant and it could kill it pretty immediately. <laughs> Um, but general watering tips when you do that as well, um, it's just, you really want to, and this is what you do uh, in general, um, but particularly when you uh, are fertilizing, is make sure that you get it all around the surface area. So you're, you're touching every point in the surface area. So when you're done, the entire top uh, of the pot is, is saturated, essentially. And this one is actually designed, so if you, if you dilute it enough, you can actually uh, if you want to continue to promote growth, you can actually do this, they say, with every single watering. Now, I mean, I think that's another tactic maybe to sell more product, um, but you can do that. I do it like every other time. Um, do we have a question on that? All right. Yeah, I apologize. I can't really demonstrate everything. We'd be here all night, um, but I thought I'd do a little mini demo. Uh, pests. This is something that I hope you don't have the misfortune of having to deal with, but it is an inevitable, uh, you know, situation. If you buy it, your plants from chalet, your uh, chances of getting pests. You know, a lot, a lot of times the the pests. If you go to, you know, Home Depot or something like that, where they are not really concerned with caring for those plants as much as the garden center is. Um, sorry, it might be a cheap shop, but it is what it is. A lot of times you take uh, pests home with you. Uh, it's an unfortunate reality. Um, but uh, other times, you know, pests are just, you know, in your home or find your way, its way uh, from out, outside to in and is attracted to your plant. And um, you can look up pictures on the internet. I, I meant to put pictures in here for you guys of these uh, beautiful organisms. But um, this is where you foster your, uh, you know, observation skills. Fungus gnats, they're going to be flying around, you know, nice little small uh, uh, flies, if you will, uh, flying around the plant. Uh, thrips, these are brown bugs crawling on the leaves themselves. So this is good every once in a while, kind of observe the top of the leaf and, you know, see if there's any little bugs on top. You might have to really squint your eyes, but you can see them if you look closely enough. Uh, mealy bugs, spider mites, 
and scale. Uh, all of these leave kind of a, a white film or even a webbing, or kind of different depending on which one it is. But if you see anything white uh, that looks a little um, gross, that is uh, you know, probably a pest. And there are ways to prevent it. So I actually have um, this product here by you know, Bonai. Bonai makes a lot of these types of products. Um, but this is something that you can prevent where it's, it's called systemic, where essentially you kind of, it's a, uh, there are little granules that you put over the top of the surface area of the plant, um, and then water it in so that the roots uptake it. And then it kind of gives it a little bit of a, it's kind of like a vitamin C, gives it a little bit of a, a boost to be able to uh, fight off these pests. Um, but you know, so, sometimes it happens. Uh, we won't nerd out too much. We have a nerd at Chalet, uh, Jennifer Brennan. Um, and so if you have situations where you think you might have a pest, uh, you know, email in a picture to us and we'll actually, you know, observe them. We do have a way where you can bring in uh, a leaf and a brown paper bag, or excuse me, a, a Ziploc bag so that we're not spreading anything. And we have a, a little lab that we can uh, look under the microscope to see exactly what uh, is ailing your plant. And we have all of the uh, remedies for it, you know, uh, whether it be a spray or, or what have you to get rid of the uh, no pests. All right, soil structure. This is another one of kind of those higher level uh, considerations uh, about the basics, but I wanted to touch on it. Um, your, your plants should come in the appropriate soil medium. Uh, when I say medium, I mean like the actual soil itself. Uh, over time, the soil does become more compact just naturally over as you water it. Uh, and compact is uh, typically not good. Some plants like more compact than others, but uh, comp being co too compact, too tight together, uh, what's going to happen is you're not going to be able to get the water through. And like we talked about before, we want to get the entire root ball soaked so that you have a nice even distribution of the water for uh, the roots to grow in evenly and uh, you know, soak up. Um, so good old fashioned approach, chopsticks. You can actually just stick chopsticks into the soil and you know, leave them there for a few hours, leave them there for a day, take it out, move it to a new, new spot. And that will uh, prove to aerate uh, the soil and give kind of lanes for the water to move and permeate uh, around the, the root ball um, when you water it. Humidity and temperature. Um, and this is a good thing to talk about after just getting out of the Chicago winter. Um, I've been monitoring my, my humidity. Unfortunately, uh, if you don't have a humidifier, it's typically you know in the 20s, maybe the 30s if you're lucky. Uh, ideal humidity is between 40 to 60. Uh, it's not to say your plant's just gonna die if it's lower, but uh, you're gonna get those crispy edges that you saw with the clapia. I'll show you that again. I'll show you a leaf that's really, this guy is kind of really uh, showing symptoms of that. And it is what it is. I mean, I, I understand this plant's not gonna die on me. It'll make it through the winter, but it's just kind of showing a little bit of signs of distress. But, you know, spring is, spring is coming. The, the humidity will naturally go back up and, he, you know, he should be just fine. Uh, temperature, rule of thumb, if you're comfortable, the plant probably is too. Um, you know, as long as you're, you know, 68, 70 degrees, whatever it might be. Uh, the only thought is that if you're, you know, bring it, bring it home from the store, uh, in a cold day or, you know, trading it with your friend or whatever it might be, uh, just make sure it's not exposed to that freezing air. You're going to want to wrap it up, uh, in either, you know, paper or, you know, whatever you might have. And we, we do that for you at Chalet. All right. Easy care plants. Um, just going to touch on a few of my, my top favorites here. Um, I know this is, you know, especially a one-on-one -on -one topic. It's like, okay, where, where, where do I start? What, what, what plant should I start with? And, you know, so that I, I have the most success. Uh, Drosena, I will say that that is my favorite, what I'll call family of plants. And this is a good opportunity to kind of teach you guys what you know, naming conventions of plants. It's, it's, it's fairly confusing. 
I'll say Drosena, that doesn't refer to one plant, it refers to a family of plants. And so this is a super wide ranging uh, family or genus of plants uh, where you get one like this. This is about four feet tall and uh, you know, is in a bush form. And this is actually called a Nita bush. And so all of the different varieties of the Drosena family uh, and, and any family for that matter will have their own uh, what's called a common name, which really, you know, so Dros the Drosena term, that is a Latin uh, or botanical name for the plant. And Drosena is easy enough to pronounce, but for example, ZZ plant, uh, Zemicula samifolia. So that, that's the Latin name and it doesn't roll off the tongue super nicely. Uh, so they call it ZZ plant is the uh, common name. Uh, and so Drosena uh, has a nice wide ranging uh, variety of, of plants. And what you might, you might look at these like, how are these in the same family? Well, this guy, it's really about the uh, shape of the leaf. And this, you know, you'll, you'll notice that it's kind of elongated and a pointy edge. Kind of really describes this one, uh, or any Drosena. This one is a uh, lemon lime, is the common name for this guy. Um, so yeah, I love these guys. Great, great category to start with. Um, once you start shopping for them. Uh, peace lily, it's right there in the middle. Uh, ironically, that's one of the few plants that I've killed in my life, uh, but I just happened to you know, leave it at, 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 uh, at home and, and went on vacation and didn't water. That was just totally my fault. But peace lily are, is fun because it'll tell you when it needs water. and It'll give you a nice, nice warning sign where the leaves are kind of nice and perky when it's, when it's happy. And then over time, it'll slowly kind of look a little bit more and more depressed and the leaves will just kind of wilt over. And it gives you a nice, nice warning to say, I need some more water. Um, so some plants are nice like that, where it just kind of tells you when to water them. Um, but yeah, I got back from vacation. It was just basically completely wilted and done for. <laughs> um, spider plant, that, that picture's in the bottom uh, left there. Another great one. Uh, snake plant. That, that picture's on the top there. I have one here. Uh, I'll, I'm going to allude to snake plants a little bit later as well. They have some cool benefits. Uh, repotting and top dressing. What what time do we got? Time check here. We're at we're at six oh four. Oh shoot. Okay. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna speed through this a little bit. I want to give time for questions. I will say that repotting, um, you know, I know you guys wanted to uh, learn about this. I think, you know, a demonstration is great for this. I don't think we've got time for a demonstration, but, um, you know, you have the steps here. And I, I will say that uh, you can really pass Houseplants 101, really. I'll, I'll give you an A for Houseplants 101 without mastering repotting. And, and that's really because you shouldn't have to worry about that. And here's another jab at Home Depot, but they might give you a plant that, that's what's called uh, root bound. And so you get it there, you might end up having to check the, the root system, um, which right, you'll see in that picture uh, is that's what's called root bound. And essentially the plant, the, the leaf or the, uh, the roots want to grow, they want to keep growing so that they can continue to produce uh, more beautiful leaves, but they just have nowhere to go. So they keep just circling around the bottom of the pot not super healthy, healthy for the plant, it's kind of choking itself. Uh, so that's the sign that you want to uh, find a new, a new pot. And you're really looking at, so if you say you have an eight inch pot, uh, typically you're talking, uh, you know, the pots that you're getting from chalet or where have you, uh, you're, you're really going with even, you're gonna find even um, numbers. There is, there is five, seven, nine, but, uh, so if you're an eight, maybe go to nine, or more likely find a 10. Um, don't go too far up. Don't go from say like an eight to a 12 um, because you do want to keep it, you kind of want to ease, ease the transition. You don't want it to, uh, you want to remain, keep it a little bit compact. So if it goes from super compact to super loose, it's, it's not really gonna like that. Um, so I mentioned there, important thing to do is kind of cut the, the bottom um, of those roots, open it up. And that really kind of tells it, all right, it's time to, uh, open up and gives them a chance to uh, kind of grow in a different direction than, you know, circling around the bottom of the pot. 
uh, top dressing really is kind of uh, something. So, so repotting, you can get away with in most cases, not doing that for two or three years, um, even four or five. I mean, as long as the plant is still growing and showing new, new growth, um, you know, you're, you're usually fine. A lot of times when it's growing, it's growing, it's, it's looking great, and then it stops growing, that might be because it's kind of tapped out from a, a, a root standpoint. Uh, top dressing is something you can maybe do intermediately uh, along, you know, beforehand is really just scooping out the top two uh, inches of um, the soil and refreshing it with a little bit more uh, new uh, potting soil. And those nutrients will kind of make its way down through the root ball. Sorry, I'm breezing through this, but I don't want to keep you guys too late. Uh, propagation, super fun. I, I will say that, again, you can you can pass houseplants 101 without learning to propagate. Uh, it's not an essential thing. It's just kind of a fun thing to do. Uh, and it is a way that, you know, basic idea is that you're creating a new plant from the, your, your original plant. And there's two, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but when you talk specifically about propagation, there's two ways to, two techniques, and that's stem cuttings versus leaf cuttings. I just talk about stem cuttings here because uh, leaf cutting is a little bit more technical, and I don't want to overwhelm you guys, but, uh, so start with stem cuttings if that's your first time, uh, but the steps are, are right there. It, it, I mean, it's really cool. It's, it's just essentially the idea of, cutting off you know nice healthy leaf from or you know strand uh from you know in this case it was a pothos um we just showed sorry i forgot your, your name but we we're showing the pothos where it's kind of a trailing vine those those types of plants you know, the, the ivies those types of plants are, are really good for for stem cutting and you kind of uh just take off uh, one of its arms if you will stick it in some water and it's amazing you know some light give it the, the variables that it needs for the inputs and it'll just start to grow and it'll grow actual roots out of the bottom of that cutting. And then once it's significant enough, you kind of play around with it. And if you have you know, a small pot that you're able to put it in there and then allow it to continue growing uh, in there. Oh, and uh, I, I dropped a, I'll, I'll send you guys these slides after, but I dropped a, a YouTube link because uh, one of my colleagues, Stephanie, just did a, uh, a uh, learning center class on propagation. So I would definitely uh, advise you guys to check that out if you're interested. Uh, house plants and wellness. All right, you guys are the wellness club. I uh, definitely want to talk about how house plants can uh, be good for us. Um, all kinds of studies are coming out. I just cited one right here. Um, they've proven that house plants can improve concentration and productivity by up to 15%. Uh, reduce stress levels and boost your mood. Um, and we'll go into, you know, they're, they're, we're starting to uncover why that is, you know, the actual science behind that. We'll go into a couple ways directly that uh, houseplants can affect us as humans. Um, and then there's a, I'll, I'll finish off with a little bit more of a uh, abstract concept of it. You know, th these concepts are getting, as studies are done, they're getting more abstract to, to real as they're able to put some numbers to it. It's, it's kind of cool, the, the things that they're finding. Uh, I'm sure you've heard this before. So NASA did a study, uh, it was actually a few decades ago now, um, but much cited that that list on the bottom uh, are plants that you'll see that are particularly uh, considered air purifying. And so, you know, carbon dioxide is one of those inputs that goes into the plants. The, the plant absorbs the carbon dioxide but these particular plants not only absorb the carbon dioxide, but also absorb uh, these volatile organic compounds or VOCs uh, that are not good for us to breathe in. Uh, and neither, you know, neither is carbon dioxide at too high levels for that matter. Uh, so generally it's taking things out of the air uh, that we don't want in our lungs. So uh, what, what are VOCs? They, they include a variety of chemicals some of which may have short and long-term you know, adverse health effects, like I said. Um, this, if you see here on the right, this is actually, I have a little device that I've been, because I'm a huge nerd and just kind of tinkering with this kind of stuff. I have this little device and I actually can walk around and I'll put it on my bell loop sometimes and 
you know, people look at me and see that you just know that I'm a, a super nerd, but, <laughs> but uh, you're essentially walking around, you're kind of seeing where, uh, the, what the, the level of volatile organic compounds are in the environment. And I particularly do this uh, for my home um, because uh, it, it's known to be 10 times higher indoors due to just the household products that we use, whether it be cleaners or just, you know, things that you bring home, uh, you know, that just happen to give off some of these uh, volatile organic compounds. And so I'm trying to measure that. Um, the picture you see here on the right is actually me walking through chalet and I'm walking through the normal part of chalet. So you see on the, uh, on the bottom axis here, that, that's over time in just a few minutes here. So I'm, I'm kind of walking around the store. And as I walk into the greenhouse, you can see how those uh, VOC uh, levels decrease. Now it's, it's in the blue category. So even in, within the store, it wasn't, it wasn't bad. It'll, it'll be in, those dots will be red um, when, when it's too high. And that's really when it gets above 1.0. I've seen in my house, it'd be like 1.5 and 1.7 uh, sometimes. So that, that's scary. You know, lights up in red and says something wrong in your house and you more, you need more plants is what it's saying basically. Uh, but just kind of cool to see that. Uh, Cause I, I read all these studies, but like you, I'm like, okay, you know, who are these people that studied it and you know, how true is this? And it seems to be true. Uh, oxygen producing. So that's one of the, the outputs. It outputs something that we input into our bodies, which is awesome. Uh, generally speaking, without getting into the science, you know, oxygen is what we breathe in, and then that gives us energy, just like uh, plants are taking in the carbon dioxide and giving themselves energy. So you can really uh, attribute that to, you know, we all want more energy, be able to accomplish more in our day. Having more plants in the house is going to give you more oxygen, give you more energy basic idea behind that. Um, particularly this list of plants, this is a really cool concept. So all plants emit oxygen, but these plants emit oxygen during the night. So if you want to get a good night, healthy night's sleep and breathe in as much oxygen in the meantime, put one of these plants in your bedroom. I actually have two snake plants in my bedroom. This is one of them. Um, looks great and it's, it's healthy. Okay, we're going from specific to a little more abstract, but again, a lot of studies been being doing, done on this. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of the term biophilia, but if not, great, you, you do now. Um, biophilia hypothesis suggests that humans possess an innate tendency to seek connections with nature and other forms of life. So, Super nerdy book there in the bottom left, The Biophilia Hypothesis by Edward O. Wilson. Um, it is very dense <laughs> and hard to get through, but I actually took the time to read, read it. If you're interested in it, go for it. Um, I'll, I'm gonna show you guys a quote so you can kind of get, get an idea of what type of things they're saying, but uh, super cool concept, the idea that we have an innate connection to nature and by spending all our time in, indoors, just staring at screens, we're kind of removing ourselves from that connection. And that in some of these studies that are coming out, we talk about you know, mental health being in the news all the time um, and people wondering why people are getting, having mental health issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's tough to just make a broad generalization, generalization that's because of our disconnection from nature, but. I do believe, and you know, the authors of these books that I recommend also believe that uh, that has a huge effect on it. Um, you know, removing ourselves from nature. Uh, anti-cancer selling or anti-anti-cancer killer cells. That is a new thing. Even the Wall Street Journal just came out with an article about it. Uh, that second book there, kind of the the bio, so the biophilia effect, which is kind of a follow-on to Edward O. Wilson's book. Uh, by Clemens Arve. I just got done reading that. It is cutting edge uh, studies into, I think they're called uh, terpenes, which is literally, you know, in addition to oxygen, plants give off these, these cells into the air. That if we breathe them in, they will kill any cancer cells. And it just speaks to kind of the symbiotic relationship that plants 
and humans have created over time. And so obviously if you wanna get outside into a forest or what have you, that's your best uh, bet to, take, to get that effect. But uh, especially if we live in urban environments, that's maybe not as approachable for us. And so house plants are sort of your most approachable connection to getting that effect. And it's being, you know, who knows how, how many of, you know, these cells, this, this uh, snake plant or this fiddly fig is gonna give off. But, um, you know, the, the idea is that it's something and it does have an effect. And they're, they're knowing more and more about that as we go. Oh, and I skipped over, uh, I love this concept. I think of gardening, house plant care, uh, you know, connecting to nature in that way, a plant that you own, that's kind of yours that you're looking after. And, you know, it goes back to the plant parenthood concept. It's, you're creating that relationship with the plant and you're, it's almost like you're having a conversation with it where you might not be talking to it. You can talk to it if you want, but it's really kind of a back and forth where you're observing it, understanding what its needs are by seeing those different uh, things happening to it, whether it's turning brown, yellow, what have you. Uh, responding by watering, fertilizing, seeing how that in turn responds to you, building that relationship over time and just uh, having, to, it, it is super rewarding to uh, have, you know, a multi-year relationship with the plant and be able to see it grow. You know, so this, this guy is, I've had this plant in multiple condos. Um, it's the fiddle leaf fig, one of the more popular plants you've probably seen around everywhere, but this guy I've had for like six years through three different, uh, condos and it has grown probably it is probably double in size and that's just super rewarding all right i'm going to leave you guys with a super thought-provoking quote from the biophilia hypothesis and edward o wilson now, i'm just going to drop this on you guys and then you guys are going to go away thinking with your with your mind blown all right you guys ready People can grow up with the outward appearance of normality in an environment largely stripped of plants and animals in the same way that a passable looking monkey can be raised in laboratory cages. Asked if they were happy, those people would probably say yes. Yet something vitally important would be missing. Not merely the knowledge and pleasure that can be imagined might have been, but a wide array of experiences of the human brain is particularly equipped to receive. We modern humans spend inordinate sums of money on dream vacations that transport us back to our tropical beginnings. We deliberately seek out environments with lush, flush with water, green trees, flowers, and grass adorned by spectacular sunsets and capped off by sumptuous meals. All experienced from the comfortable refuges in the company of close companions. Our emotional attachment to nature and its processes is as much a part of human life as are the modern technologies that make our journey to paradise possible. So that speaks to, I think that sums up, you know, the message of that book really is uh, the idea that we've created this environment, this society for us, ourselves today where we're largely removed uh, from nature. We, we try to get back to nature as a general goal, uh, vacation to places where we're able to immerse ourselves in nature, but our, our day-to-day -day life is just largely nature-free. So if you're not able to get into a forest or you know spend a lot of time in the park, um, I urge you to bring house plants into your life, foster that connection with nature, uh, and try to uh, kind of buck the trend of us just spending uh, our lives nature-free. All right, so I don't know, I probably went over time, but I'll take any general questions at this point, uh, but you know, here's my, my contact info um, and uh, a discount code as well. So go to shallownursery.com, uh, feel free to shop for some of those indoor plants um, and use Thrive Week 15, 15% off. All right, any, any questions for Lawson um, before we wrap up? I don't think I'm seeing any. I have a quick one. Um, 
just as we get into spring here, like I know that 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 changes some of the plant care, like as far as adding nutrients and things like that. Is there any just really quick tips on like how to be prepared for kind of growing season? Uh, as it pertains to indoor plants. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So going into the spring, you know, you know as we said, there's different implications around the different seasons. Uh, spring, if you want to get the most out of spring, so uh, we're, we're coming out of the winter. Some of these house plants just had a rough time with, with that lack of humidity. And now you're going to get some of that humidity. Um, I would definitely urge you to open up your windows, get some of that humidity inside, that fresh air. They'll like that. Um, and aside to that, you can actually bring some of your plants outdoors if you want. Um, there's some techniques around that that you'll want to. Uh, be cognizant of, but generally it's going to love that humidity and extra light that's going to come with the, uh, the, the increase in sun. And so that is a time that even if you weren't fertilizing before, definitely fertilize during the spring because as you're, and, and of course, as we talked about, increase the water, uh, because as you're increasing that input of the sun, it's going to be expecting in order to get the max output, it's going to be expecting more water, more nutrients, in order to balance that out and just and really just get the most uh, uh, new growth out of that spring. Awesome, thank you. Sure. All right, well, thanks so much, Lawson. Really appreciate you joining. I know I am going to Chalet um, this weekend. <laughs> so definitely encourage everyone to go. It's an awesome store, um, amazing plants, and they have all the answers if you need any help with anything. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll follow up with um, the recording and these slides and um, anything else you guys need. Thanks. Yep. And actually, feel free to connect with me. My email's right there. Happy to keep the conversation going. So thank you guys, thanks for having me. Thank you. Lawson, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Does Chalet do like plant doctor consultation video <laughs> chats? <laughs> yes, that's an awesome question. So. That's something, and I don't know if I still have Carly on mine. I was actually uh, left, but my sister Carly's in the marketing department in Chalet, and, and we're, you know, they're in particular trying to, uh, we're trying to do that more and more. In particular, with COVID last year, we were sort of for forced to uh, engage with customers in that way who were comfortable or uncomfortable coming into the store. Um, and so, typically, what we've done is uh, shopping appointments where. You, you know, you can shop through the store with uh, a salesperson, but now we're, we're kind of pivoting to uh, where you can have what we're calling plant healthcare. Uh, we're calling it plant healthcare clinic, and you can actually uh, connect over Zoom. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to dig up that link for you um, and, uh, and send that to you. That would uh, be great. Maybe if you, if you want to send me an email, lawsontshellinger.com, that way I have your email and then I can point you in the right direction but yeah that's something we uh we definitely want to do more and more because that, that's what people want especially um you know if it's difficult to get to the store so we'd love to hear your feedback on how that, that goes will do thank you appreciate it yeah thank you and thanks for, for sharing with us have a good Absolutely. night you too